Good morning, everybody. This is Michael DeCarlo, a write-in candidate for United States Senate from the great state of Arizona. It's approximately 9.50 in the morning on Tuesday, October the 16th, the day after the PBS non-broadcasted debate between Peppermint Patty and the arguments that ensued. I am extremely disappointed in the public broadcasting system for not for myself not getting invited, but actually for not inviting the Green Party member who was actually on the ballot. Uh, I'm a writing candidate, so you have to write me in, circle a little thing and spell my name. Uh, spell it like that, Michael DiCarlo. Right? So I understand I'm going uphill here because I'm going against the establishment, which is fine. I'm a sub retired submariner, so I've always seen things a little bit different than everybody else uh, based, based upon my trade. But anyway, I went through the debate which was not broadcast down here on the border in Sierra Vista, Arizona, on PBS. So all the concern that PBS and uh, candidates say that they show toward the border, it's all crap because people weren't able to watch it. They had to, in order to watch it, you had to stream it live, which wasn't, I didn't find that anywhere. I actually have PBS on here in the garage of the DeCarlosDanger.com Worldwide Headquarters. It's my blog, uh, which you can actually read and start from the beginning. It's about a year and a half's worth of uh, scribes, and you could pretty much deduce my platform from there. I will be writing one up today. I actually was asked for uh, some uh, more of a platform paper to write down and provide to folks down here that work on Fort Huachuca because they believe that uh, the current representation for this congressional district is faulty and the concern is more focused on Tucson than in Sierra Vista, which is a border town along the border. And yeah, we'll just go for that. Anyway, I wrote, I got uh, two sides. These are the questions that were asked, and I'm going to go through and answer them. And I won't take 90 seconds because there's too much fluff in here and arguing back and forth. So I'll be really clear and concise. We'll try to knock this out in 15, maybe 20 minutes. So if you got the time, I'd appreciate it if you listen. And I would ask for your vote because if you reflect and think outside the box, you will realize that for a lot of folks, I am the best choice to be your representative in the United States Senate. First question. You were once a critic of the uh, and of the Trump of Trump. And, that, and now you're a supporter. What has changed? Uh, nothing. For me, what has changed is that uh, I was a diehard defender of, of American freedom around the world. I have as many days off the coast of countries that we don't get along with that my Congress lady has sorties. So my understanding of a lot of these areas and the conflicts of the world is just as strong as hers. What has changed for me is that I comprehend beyond a reasonable doubt that books were written years ago, uh, say by Smedley Butler, the retired Marine Major General, who wrote a book, War is a Racket. Uh, what has changed, in my opinion, is that once you quantify that it's dehumanized the act of war, whether it be trade or whatever, your, your view of it changes. I was fortunate enough during the 90s to actually, during a, a perestroika and glasnost, to visit a Soviet Union warship and shake the hands, shake the hands with sailors, because I was a sailor at the time. I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, and through a translator, come to the conclusion and actually say to each other that it is best that we don't have to fight each other. This, we humanized the big, big enemy. We dehumanized or humanized the big red bear, the big scare. And based upon that experience, I worked pretty hard to maintain a peace in certain places around the world. Uh, second question is. Are you proud of the president has acted in office? I actually respect the president of the United States, and I see him as an opportunity for all of us Americans to stand up and take our government back. 
regardless of poly, party affiliation. Uh, the red and blue teams, all the conclusions and solutions that they reach are not in our best interest at all. All they are really for are to create more division to win the next election. Uh, if you wanted a problem solver, I know a fella, and that would be me, because there are no problems, there's only solutions. The third question is the Senate confirm confirmations on Brett Kavanaugh uh, were uh, quite disturbing. Uh, the question, and you know, I don't anticipate being on the ju Judicial Committee, that would be a line of questioning here, but a uh, question I would have drilled down on would have been Fourth Amendment rights to privacy to be left alone and his interpretations on the appellate court of how the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply if the government needs to go through your stuff in order to keep us all safe. And that would have brought in the 100 uh, mile constitution free zone, which about 70% of us live in in this country, where we don't have constitutional protections. And the reason that's important is because the Constitution constrains the government from taking your life, liberty, and your property. The rights that we have come from our Creator. They do not come from government, because if government can give you, give you something, it can also take it away. And that'll be a recurring theme here in the future that you'll hear. Uh, next question is, are there sticking points in, in Supreme Court nominations with Roe v. Wade? I'm adopted. My oldest daughter's adopted. I've done everything in my life to uh, provide opportunities because we all have we are all have opportunities and we all have potential. I don't think that interpretation of Roe v. Wade is the most important part in a judicial nominee to the Supreme Court. I believe that the most important part would be the interpretation of the Constitution. The interpretation of the Constitution is limited government, which means that that confines government to a box. And it goes back to what it can do and what it cannot do as far as taking away your life, liberty, and property. Uh, I find it really odd that the blue team members are pro-abortion, killing, killing children, which I think is, myself, I believe is a uh, disgusting act. Uh, but the red team is about killing criminals. So how can you be pro-life and pro-death penalty? I would be pro-life and anti-death penalty. And that's, yes, it will cost us more as a society, but I don't believe that we or the government has a right of taking away anybody's life. Healthcare, number five. How much should government be involved in healthcare, specifically for those with pre-existing conditions? Well, the specifically was the redraw there. The first initial question is how much should government be involved in healthcare? Government should in my eyes, should not be involved in healthcare. The only people that should be involved in healthcare is yourself and your doctor. The moment that a third party gets involved, then options are removed from the table. They're removed from the table because the affordable, everything in government is upside down. The Affordable Care Act is unaffordable. It should have been termed the Unaffordable Care Act, and that would have been more appropriate because once elements of government, the bureaucrats are involved in solving problems. They are not going to ever solve problems because once those problems are solved, they're not going to have any jobs. So their job is to create a solution that propels their need in the future to provide first conflict and then more solutions. Now those solutions are not going to be valid. They're not going to help you or I as American citizens. Uh, those are pre-existing conditions. We have there are social safety nets that allow for folks to be have care. And those social safety nets have been in place for a long time. Could we do better at that? Yes, we could. And I think that those would be the areas where we would need to address. But less government in your life, all the way across the board. Socialized health care does not mean it's competent. Okay. And number six, where do you stand on strengthening Social Security and Medicaid or Medicare for senior citizens? Poor folks have been taxed all their life for Social Security and Medicare. The only way that you're going to strengthen those two issues 
would be to reduce the burden on the top end. And it comes down to, this tends down to a piece of pie or a piece of cake. If you want to look at it as a circle, if you want to look at it as a square. Uh, life, it's circular, right? But business is a square. And you can do trig for the circle, and you have to use algebra for the square because somebody's taking a cut once you start to do business. And once you enter the corporate arena of government, and it is a business, you have to understand that you're going to lose 20 to 30 percent of the say. Now, the best way to reduce uh, the or strengthen Social Security and Medicare would be to reduce the amount of government oversight on, on it. And but what I mean by saying that, not the over, not necessarily the oversight, but the amount of employees that are there to handle your money. Because every time it passes from one hand to another, you give them a dollar. And it passes from one hand to another. Everybody takes a penny. And once it passes through 10, or ten pe or hundred people, you get nothing left. So privatization would not necessarily be the answer, but I would encourage folks to invest in other areas and not be dependent on Social Security and Medicare for their health. S seventh question: Immigration. Would you support funding a border wall if it had a pathway for Dreamers? Now, this goes back to the 100-mile constitution-free zone. We all know that the least, the least efficient thing in this world is government. I understand the president's point of view on building a wall, and I appreciate it. But we've been here before. Before 9-11, there was going to be a virtual wall, if you can recall. They're going to have drones and sensors and all these technologies that the military uses over overseas against our enemies. Now we're going to build a wall. Now, China has a wall. You can see it from space. That culture and society is a failed society. Ronald Reagan once stood in front of the... Berlin Wall and told Mr. Gorbachev to tear, tear it down. Why are, do we, as Americans, want to build one? It's not going to stop anything, but it would be a jobs program similar to FDR's program with building the Hoover Dam and the Tennessee Valley Authority and all those uh, good things that had bad consequences in the long run because you can't control Mother Nature. Number eight, recognizing America's Child Act, so DACA, or recognizing the Defense of America's Children's Act, DACA. Now, DACA is a slippery slope, but then again, history does repeat itself. This one here has been, what, about, uh, was it 80, so about 30 years or whatever, and repeats itself. We've been here before. Uh, there was an amnesty program that Ronald Reagan put out where people flooded down the Social Security offices and everything, and that was one of their things they had to do to become citizens. Now, I respect the folks that are here, the hardworking folk. I really do. Um, the criminal elements that are involved with them cause a huge cloud to be put over these people, which is sad. But when you do the math, if you recall, when we went into Afghanistan, there was about twenty to 30,000 enemy combatants or uh, terrorists radical Islamic terrorists and terrorism, but yet we're still there. So instead of going to war overseas, we're going to go to war with our own people, and we're going to continue to take constitutional rights, things that, that can find government away from you and I, to combat them. Now, if... The border was secure, and we've been paying for border security for a long time, and we've been employing people there for a long time. If the border, if, the, if their job was done, then we wouldn't have this problem. But unfortunately, when you work for the federal government, you don't ever want to solve a problem. You just want to manage it. When you manage problems, you're going to say, I need more money, I need more money, I need more money, and you're going to spend a bunch of money at the end of the year in order to substantiate the need for future spending. It's really... 
It's a terrible cycle. Uh, number nine, would you support a partial government shutdown to fund the border wall? Absolutely not. Uh, government shutdowns are, uh, being a military person myself, they're a bunch of crap. Uh, they are politicians throwing hissy, hissy fits and tantrums and not solving problems. Politicians are, that are in office and have been there for decades do not, all they're worried about is their next election cycle. They do not have your best interest at heart or mind. Number 10, do you support the Trump administration's zero tolerance enforcement created by family separation? This was an interesting question, I thought, and I'm, and I'm glad that they asked it. What people fail to remember is that in 2011, the same thing happened under a previous administration, and the same laws were enforced. This, there was nothing, there's nothing new under the sun here, folks. This is nothing more than a repeat to distract you from more pertinent information that you need to be aware of. Uh, if I recall correctly, that was right around the time Benghazi happened. If I recall correctly now, that was right around the time all this 5G in, uh, infrastructure was getting passed. This 5G infrastructure is going to be its going to be detrimental to our society in the long run. We'll have faster communications. However, uh, let me demonstrate this right here for you. When your body reproduces cells at a rate that your body reproduces cells, but when these radio waves go through your body, it forces your cells to... Uh, reproduce faster than they want to. And when they do that, at times, you end up with waste on the end here. This waste is usually, thank goodness, uh, removed, and usually we get we remove it for our body when we go to the bathroom, whether it's through urination or defecation. But when one of these things stick on here, that provides an opportunity for a tumor to grow. And it's almost like we're creating more reasons for medical problems. It is what it is. Uh, number 11. Was family separation a choice for the president? Could, or a choice a president could have made to keep families together as opposed to the law where he had no choice? This is an interesting uh, question, I find. It's almost like the press was, is looking for a king. Kings don't exist in this country. Well, at least they're not supposed to. And that's really where executive orders are, in the long run, terrible. Because you end up with a generation of folks who forget that Congress, or the con job of Congress, through the House of Representatives, that's the voice of the people, and through the United States Senate, of which I seek office, is, is supposed to represent the state's point of view and the state's interest. Now, it isn't that he had a choice. We've already shown that executive orders can be made and from dictate from a land far, far away. I don't think that's in the best interest of Americans to get in that routine. Because as I said before, we don't need a king. We actually had a war with the king a couple hundred years ago, if you can recall. Twelve. So enforcing the law superseded keeping families together. Well, Creating another law to dictate from an office just merely because he is the executive would be the wrong move as well. He was in a place where he couldn't win, no matter who he tried to help. And no matter what he did, it was going to be spun way or, one way or the other. And maintaining the status quo was most likely the best course of action for the president. 13. Budget deficit. Do you support tax cuts? And do you support deficit spending? Yes, I support tax cuts because that any way we can reduce the burden on every American is the best way to allow people to live their lives. Now, I do not support deficit spending, but here's the rub, folks, is that there are so many government employees or contractors who work for the government or subcontractors who work for the government or people who get grants from the government that when you don't deficit spend, you are going to, the unemployment rate is going to increase so much because everybody is, and everything is dependent upon government wanting one way or the other, whether that be entrepreneurs who sell products to folks who work for the government. They would be adversely affected if we cut those. If they were on unemployment, they wouldn't have as much disposable income. 
So there's a careful balance here. And we have to realize that a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other isn't going to solve any more problems than it will it'll increase the it'll increase problems at first. But the best answer to this is to not be dependent upon the government for your water or your food and to be as independent as you can. Plant a garden in the back in your backyard. Uh, grow your own food. Harvest your own meat if you have the opportunity. Or part, have a partner down the road that harvests meat and you can trade vegetables for it. It's, there's, a, there's a program here where we could actually work together. Now, is that going to work for everybody? Absolutely not, especially in the cities. But the cities are the folks that say, take care of me, take care of me. So there's, there's careful balance there. There's folks that live in rural areas like myself. That not, it's, not real, it's not rural, it's actually a city, but it's kind of rural. It's, we had a mass exodus here in the last five years uh, when the federal spending dried up for the military industrial complex down the street, Fort Huachuca, which is the military intelligence center of excellence, or as I like to call it, where the lie begins. And the last one here, do you believe climate, climate change is made by humans? And what are plans, what plans do you have for co combating climate change, particularly with the water and water resources? Number one, I do not believe climate change is caused by our Israel. Uh, as a submariner and somebody who understands how the depth of the water on the coastlines, I would have seen it in my survey because this climate change thing's been going on for a long time. If you can recall, the last climate change that we had was in during a time when we had a cold war. It were uh, greenhouse gases are were going to make the world colder. I think that this is a redirection to keep your mind off the ball and not pay attention to what's actually going on around you. Uh, the water Water resources here in Arizona are, in particularly my area, where we're tied into the Gila River adjudication, and we re recently had a ruling a lot permitting a development to uh, that said they had 100 water, 100, 100 uh, years of uh, water adequacy approved. I did receive a letter from Save Our Wells down here in Cochise County, in which I support. Their concern is that a private water well could be shut down because it was drilled after 1988. These, this court ruling, that's court opinion, courts don't rule, kings rule, we don't have kings. Uh, opinion that's gonna be coming down, it's gonna, if it comes down a long way, is actually gonna cause people who bought homes down here, senior citizens, it's gonna fleece them of their value because they bought homes down here as to retire and live off of the social security and be taken care of a Medicaid and once that's removed, they're really going to be in an adverse, they're going to adverse uh, financial situation, and it's going to be based upon government being involved. Then we have our closing statement. My name is Michael DeCarlo. I'm a retired submarine Navy chief. I worked as a contractor after retirement for the United States Army. I did worked in the field of electronic warfare, jamming, uh, so that remote controlled. IEDs did not blow up and, and protected our troops. After that, I worked as a contractor for the Army again, got promoted to a company intelligence support team where you're able to deduce indicators that may mean something was going to happen based upon this. This is the part where I say that you're looking, it's a bunch of kabuki theater. You're being presented with this Kavanaugh hearing, which was probably during sweeps week to increase the ratings for the television while the 5G systems were going, getting passed. You were distracted by the, the original in 2011, the, DAC, the, the immigrants flooding across the border on the trains. Or, was it 11, 13, something like that? Well, they're coming across there, but the whole thing was is that it was going on the same time that the Benghazi investigation was going on. I asked for your vote because I think that if we're gonna allow the government to do things, let's have them investigate themselves. Let's have them look into the to Fast and Furious. Let's let them have look into Benghazi and investigate that. Let's let them look into 9-11. And 
how about uh, other instances like that? Because a lot of scientific principles were are violated and were presented to you and I as considered fact. And the painful part as somebody who has thought critically and was trained to think critically for his whole life, especially in the submarine force, and to anticipate tomorrow, yesterday, just based upon pure survival, it's really difficult to see us struggle as a society when a lot of times the truth is as plain as the nose on our face. Again, my name is Michael DiCarlo. I thank you for watching. Please write in Michael DiCarlo for United States Senate because the public broadcasting system did nothing but service the public like the system it is. Take care. Big money can't buy all this stuff. We can make a difference, folks. I wish you all well, peace, happiness, and health so that you don't have to worry about government health care because the less government that's in your life, the better off we all will be.